This is going to be verse by verse of Genesis chapter 34. And I'm going to talk about the misuse of the sword. Uh, you see, in this chapter, two of Jacob's sons are going to come through and kill a bunch of men with the edge of the sword. And it's not a good killing. So I'm going to talk about the misuse of the sword. In our case, since the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, and we possess a sharp two-edged sword, I'm going to talk about how Christians will sometimes misuse their sword, the Word of God. And the first misuse of the sword is using the sword as a backup. You see, the spiritual sword should never be used as a backup. It should be used as your main primary weapon. It should be the first thing you pull out in any given situation. But you'll notice that Jacob did not build an altar until the very end of the last chapter. God has been his backup, not his go-to. What Jacob's been doing is planning first and praying second. He's been going at his own strength first and then using God and his word as a backup. And remember that if you listen to the last study, how that I told you that Jacob stopped too early and settled down in a place before he got to where God wanted him to go. He cared about the words of God, but they always came in second or third or fourth place. And he misuses the words. He misuses the sword. And that misuse of the words led to what takes place in this chapter, the horrible thing that takes place in this chapter with his daughter. Look at Genesis 34.1. It says, And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. Jacob hasn't been very hands-on with Dinah, it doesn't seem. If so, I doubt he would have let her wander off to see these daughters of the land unattended. Dinah isn't really doing anything wrong. She's doing what most young girls would do. They want friends, and this starts out as being innocent, but it's going to end badly. I mean, she wasn't going out to see the sons of the land. She wasn't in pursuit of a, a boyfriend. She just wanted some friends. I mean, she had 12 brothers, so I guess she wanted to interact with girls her age. And she runs into trouble while she's unattended. It says in verse 2, But when Shechem, and when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. Now, most people say this is rape, but it doesn't look that way if you read the whole chapter. He did defile her, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he raped her. And this guy Shechem is a prince. What do young girls get brainwashed into thinking they need? A prince. Just like on all the Disney and fairy tale movies. So, most likely this guy subtly enticed her and took advantage of her. And see, this Shechem is a Hivite. Hivites come from Ham, from Canaan. And if you remember, Ham has a sex problem back in Genesis 9. And it seems this guy does too. Now verse 3. And his soul, Shechem's soul, clave unto Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. And he loved the damsel and spake kindly unto the damsel. And this is one of the reasons why I don't believe she was raped. I mean, he was a prince, his soul clave to her, and he loved her. And you know, when Amnon, when he actually did rape somebody, his own sister, in 2 Samuel 13, after the act, it says that he hated her. But Shechem loved Dinah and spoke kindly to her. So, uh, in my opinion, it doesn't look like he did rape her. And he even wants to marry her. In Genesis 34, 4, it says, And Shechem spake unto his father Hamor, saying, Get me this damsel to wife. So another misuse of the word will be trading it in for a new sword or new words. You see, many men will take this old book and trade it in for a different one. One that's smoother, kinder, softer, and more loving-like words. You see, Dinah had to forget about any words of God that had been taught her and put them in second place 
behind Shechem's kind and loving words. He spoke kindly unto her and loved her. But the fault still goes back to Jacob. Where was Jacob? Why did he keep going to Bethel instead of hanging back? And it says in verse 5, And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah his daughter. Now his sons were with his cattle in the field, and Jacob held his peace until they were come. Jacob held his peace when he should have opened his mouth boldly and fixed the problem himself. It seems all Jacob really cares about is himself first, and then Rachel and Joseph. And he just doesn't care, seem to care as much about everybody else. But Jacob holds his peace. Jacob's been given the words of God on several occasions. He was raised by Isaac, who was raised by Abraham, a friend of God. And he should know what to do. He should have some words to live by. I mean, I know they didn't have a Bible. But Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had enough visions with the Lord to know what God wanted them to do. But another misuse of the sword is not using it, period. Which is what Jacob does. He's just going to hold his peace. And in verse 6, it says, And Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out unto Jacob to commune with him. So he's probably trying to appease Jacob's wrath about the incident, but is probably shocked that Jacob doesn't seem all that mad about it. Jacob's sons are actually more upset about it than he is. It says in verse 7, And the sons of Jacob came out of the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved, and they were very wroth, because he had wrought folly in Israel and lying with Jacob's daughter, which thing ought not to be done. So they were grieved. They were angry. I mean, this is the right response. I mean, they should be angry about what happened. Also note that it says he had wrought folly in Israel, talking about Shechem. This is the first time that Israel is used referring to the people of Israel collectively and not just referring to the individual man named Jacob who had his name changed to Israel by the Lord himself. You see, throughout the Bible, you're going to see uh, the people, the children of Israel, you know, referred to Jacob's new name. And that's, that's why they're called the children of Israel. Now, Hamer is going to try and appease the wrath of Jacob's sons. In verse 8, it says, And Hamer communed with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longeth for your daughter, and I pray you give her him to wife. So he's going to make it sound like it's a good deal. And he says, And make ye marriages with us, and give your daughters unto us, and take our daughters unto you. What makes him think that Israel wants to mix with his daughters? And it says, And ye shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade you therein, and get you possessions therein. You see, the world tries to make things look good to you, and attractive, and like you're really going to make out good in the situation. And now Shechem's even going to try and make things right with the boys. It says in verse 11, And Shechem said unto her father and unto her brethren, Let me find grace in your eyes, and what you shall say unto me I will give. He's like, Whatever it is that I can give to make it right for what I've done, just name it. You know, name your price, and I will give it. He says, Ask me never so much dowry and gift, and I will give according as as ye shall say unto me, but give me the damsel to wife. So he's like, ask me never so much dowry. Dowry is as the reward paid for a wife. Shechem's willing to give them anything they want. He just wants them to be appeased, and he also wants Dinah. He's willing to give them anything. He wants them to name the price. And the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor, his father, deceitfully, and said, because he hath defiled Dinah their sister. Now this leads to another point, another misuse of the misuse of the sword, and that is using it deceitfully. They're about to take God's covenant that was given to them by God, and they're going to use it deceitfully. In Jeremiah forty eight ten it says, Cursed be he that doeth the work of the Lord deceitfully. In Genesis thirty four fourteen it says, And they said unto them, we cannot do this thing to give our sister, you know, Dinah, to one that is uncircumcised, for that were a reproach unto us. Remember how God gave Abraham the sign of circumcision? 
Uh, he was to circumcise everyone born in his house. And, and when it comes to me and you, we shouldn't marry someone who isn't spiritually circumcised. You see, when you got saved, you got spiritually circumcised. God cut your soul loose from your flesh. And now when you sit in the flesh, those sins don't, go, don't get on your soul because your soul and flesh are no longer connected because of that spiritual circumcision. So just like the boys are claiming here that well, we can't give our sister to you because you guys are uncircumcised. They are separated. Separated when it comes to that. They don't want to mix with people who aren't circumcised. I mean, they're, they're doing this deceitfully. But when it comes down to it, they probably don't want to mix with people that are uncircumcised. And that's the way it should be for you. You shouldn't want to be married to somebody who's not saved. But the boys are speaking deceitfully. They're not really going to give them Dinah, even if they do get physically circumcised. But it says in verse 15, it says, But in this will we consent unto you, if you will be as we be, that every male of you be circumcised. Then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. This is another misuse of the sword. Don't force it on others, because it usually won't stick. Many times someone forces the gospel and salvation on someone else, and the person has no interest, or they're just trying to please you. And Shechem and Hamor and his men were getting circumcised simply to please them and to get something they wanted. And I've heard um, examples of young men pretending to get saved so that a girl would date them. They didn't really believe the gospel from the heart. They just prayed a prayer and attempted to look the part. You see, forcing the sword on someone else is a misuse of the weapon. They need to accept those words of their own free will. I've heard men going door to door, getting people to pray a prayer, which, which isn't bad, but they say, you know, if you prayed the prayer, then you got saved. Now, they could have really gotten saved, but if they just prayed it to please you and make you leave, then it's a misuse of the sword many times because they're not praying it because, you know, they want to be really sincerely want to be saved and know they're a sinner. They're just praying it to get rid of you or for, for other reasons. Now, verse 16, Then will we give our daughters unto you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. You see, another misuse of the sword is using it to join people that you don't need to join with. And many times people will come to the Bible and see verses about peace and unity and things like that, and those ver and those use those verses to make you think that you need to get together with all other religions and be one people. Once again, that's a misuse of the sword. You see, the sword divides. Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, but a sword. It says in verse 17, But if you will not hearken unto us to be circumcised, then will we take our daughter and we will be gone. They probably would have taken her forcibly because she was already with Shechem, which would have been better than what they are about to do. But it says in verse 18, their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. So they think this sounds like a good deal. And the young men deferred not to do the thing because he had delight in Jacob's daughter and he was more honorable than all the house of his father. You see, Shechem, the guy who laid with Dinah, was more honorable than the whole house. So that tells you about their house. It wasn't in too good a shape. But he was also honorable because he was willing to get circumcised, willing to be the first one. And Hamer and Shechem, his son, came into the gate of their city and communed with the men of their city, saying, So they came into the gate of their city, and they had a big city meeting before the courts of justice. All the big wigs were there, and they, all, they make a proposal that they all should get circumcised. Because, in verse 21, it refer, referring to Israel collectively, these men are peaceable with us. 
Therefore let them dwell in the land and trade therein, for the land, behold, it is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us for wives and let us give them our daughters. They're so wrong because Jacob's boys aren't peaceable with them at all because you're going to see what happens. He's wrong when he says the land is large enough for them. It's not even close. This is where you get the saying, this place ain't big enough for the both of us. He's wrong in saying that they're going to take their daughters to them. Uh, they're not getting Israel's daughters. In Romans twelve eighteen, it says, If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. I mean, Jacob couldn't do that with his own family. I doubt they're going to be able, would be able to do that with a bunch of Hivites. 22 through 23, Only herein will the men consent unto us for to dwell with us, to be one people, if every man, if every male among us be circumcised, as they are circumcised, shall not their cattle and their substance and every beast of theirs be ours? Only let us consent unto them, and they will dwell with us. He's so wrong and deceived, because the boys really have no plans of dwelling with them, and Israel's cattle will not be theirs. But their cattle will be Israel's, as you're going to see soon. Verse 24, And unto Hamer and unto Shechem his son hearkened all that went out of the gate of this, his city, and every male was circumcised, all that went out of the gate of this city. So Shechem and Hamer were deceived and in turn deceived everyone else. Many times that's what's going on. Someone gets deceived and then they go and deceive everyone else unknowingly and it leads to people dying. In the case of the cults and false religions, you got a lot of people going around that are deceived and they deceive everyone else. And now you're going to see another misuse of the sword, using it against people for vengeance. And remember that the Lord said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And Genesis thirty-four twenty-five it says, And it came to pass on the third day when they were sore, that the two sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brethren, took each man his sword and came upon the city boldly and slew all the males. You see, you can uh, misuse the sword. You can know a lot about the Bible to the point that you can literally go around and slay everyone with it. You can use it to make people look bad, point out hypocrisy, ruin their ministry, ruin their testimony. But you would be using it unrighteously. Many times you use it for vengeance, to get at somebody, to hurt somebody. This was a bad deal. It sounds cool what they did, but it was the wrong thing to do. It makes Simeon and Levi look tough, but at the same time it causes them to lose their inheritance, as you'll see. You see, Jacob's firstborn sons were Reuben, Simeon, and Levi. Reuben gets knocked out of the inheritance because of something he's about to do in the next chapter. Simeon and Levi would have been next in line to get it, but what they do here knocks them out of their inheritance. And this causes it to go to the next in line, and that will be Judah. So this is why Jesus Christ comes from the line of the tribe of Judah and not from Reuben, Simeon, and, and then Levi. Verse 26, And they slew Hamer and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah out of Shechem's house and went out. So Dinah's name means judgment. And Shechem and Hamer did wrong by taking Dinah. They were storing up judgment by holding on to Dinah. So it's funny, her name is name means judgment. And in Romans 2, 5 it says, But after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure us up unto thyself wrath, wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God. This is what a lot of people are doing with their sins. They store them up and at the same time they're storing up wrathful judgment. Genesis thirty four twenty seven. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and spoiled the city because they had defiled their sister. So Simeon and Levi did the killing and then the rest of the sons came in and cleaned house. They spoiled the city. And that just means that they went in there and and got everything that they had, you know, their stuff out of their pockets, out of their tents, and took it as theirs. And another misuse of the sword is using it to take things that aren't yours. 
Now, if it was a righteous war, it would have been different. But this was a violent deception on the part of Simeon and Levi. A lot of guys will take the Bible and use it to take things that ain't theirs. For example, your money. They know the right verses. They know the right things to say, the right songs to play, to get Grandma to open her pocketbook and send them $200. Not only do Simeon and Levi use the sword for deceitful vengeance, they also rob these guys blind with it. They took their sheep, they took their oxen and their asses, and that which was in the city, and that which was in the field, and all their wealth, and all their little ones, and their wives took they captive, and spoiled even all that was in the house. A misuse of the sword is using it to take another man's wife. That's happened. There's been times where a, a pastor or some just some random preacher went to another man's wife and said, Hey, look at these verses. This proves that it's okay for me to lay with you. It's okay for you to leave your husband and come be with me. It's okay for me to have more than one wife myself. You know, things like that. That's a misuse of the sword. You see, the sword's authoritative. People look at it as like it's an authority, which it is. It is, And you can misuse it and deceive people, taking things out of context to make them, say, make them think it says something that it doesn't say. Sumi and Levi, they even took their wives. This shows they really didn't have much of a problem with inter integration after all. And now Jacob finally steps up to the plate and says something in... Genesis, uh, Genesis 34, 30, he finally says something. And Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have troubled me to make me stink among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And I being few in number, they shall gather themselves together against me and shall slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. Jacob is probably wishing he did follow his brother Esau to Seir. He's probably wishing he did go on to Bethel. Now he's in another mess. In verse 31, it says, And they said, Should he deal with our sister as with an harlot? That was their response back to Jacob. But Jacob isn't so much worried about Dinah. Notice Jacob's priorities in the verse. He says, It says, <clears throat> But he, he, you know what Jacob says to them? He says, Ye have troubled me. You have made me to stink among the inhabitants of the land. I being few in number. They shall gather themselves together against me, they shall slay me, and I shall be destroyed, I and my house. You see, that was four me's and three I's in one verse. Jacob is only worried about Jacob, and it takes the whole verse before he even mentions anything about his house being hurt. But Dinah, Simeon, and Levi did some things that they shouldn't have done. But the big finger points right back to Jacob. He should have went where he was supposed to and been more hands-on with what he was, with what was going on instead of holding his peace. He misused the sword all the way around, and his kids, kids ended up doing the same exact thing.